Welcome to another episode of Emancipated Human. I'm your host, Luis Fernando Misses. Today we have a fantastic writer, Mary Ruart, Dr. Mary Ruart. She's a research scientist and ethicist. She's also a libertarian and uh, libertarian author and activist. And I just learned like five minutes ago that she's also an anarchist. So that's even more exciting to me. Um, she's done a lot of work in biochemistry and she received her, her PhD in biophysics. Another, another um, geek friend of ours, because I'm, I'm into those kinds of things as well. She did a lot of fantastic work with the Department of Surgery at St. Louis University. And uh, then she left there to go to Upjohn uh, up uh, Company of uh, Kalamazoo in Michigan. And uh, she did a lot of uh, research there. She was involved in developing new therapies for a variety of diseases like uh, liver cirrhosis and uh, HIV and AIDS. So she's also the chair currently of uh, ERB, and we're going to explore a little more of that in a minute. So with all those fantastic accomplishments, we welcome you, Ms. Mary. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So uh, one thing that, um, that we were talking about before I started recording is, you know, a lot of us libertarians slash anarchists we we do hate the state and you know we're always fussing about it and and uh, the idea that uh, we need to perhaps focus on on certain other things like okay what can we do about it right so that's i think where we're lacking so you equate the idea of loving your neighbor with liberty um, how can you i mean what do you make out of this a lot of people think <laughs> that libertarians don't care about the poor <laughs> Well, if you think about it for a little bit, um, the way in which we treat other people, obviously, shows whether we respect them and love them. Uh, and by love in this context, I mean, you know, universal love, not necessarily a personal love. So, if you are willing to force someone and bend them to your will, that's not a very loving act. In fact, when I first heard about libertarianism, that was my first reaction was, hey, this is just like loving your neighbor. It's a political expression of loving your neighbor because if you love your neighbor, you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to assault them, uh, whether individually or through government. So that really convinced me that there was this connection. And I liked that a lot because in my personal life, I have found that, uh, you know, being a loving person is a good way to go. Not just for the other person, but for me, because it kind of clears up your, I don't know, it, it clears things up for you. When you kind of take yourself gently out of the equation and focus on the other person, there's, um, there's a, a liberation or a freedom in that as well. And we could talk for hours about that, but <laughs> I know that's not our subject, but I just want to give the little hint to your listeners that, um, you know, we're so invested in political freedom, we sometimes forget that there's another kind of freedom, an emotional freedom that comes with this idea of loving our neighbor. And if we meld those, I think that's where we're going to get the traction. Right now, what people see in many cases is the hate you were talking about. And people are repelled by that. So, you know, we really, if we really want to see our vision of a peaceful, prosperous, and free world, we need to think about what's in it for the other person and talk to them about that. Because all these people who are advocating government force ultimately find that it doesn't do what they want. And so <laughs> once we convince them of that, life is easy. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I would agree uh, with that statement. And, um, but, you know, I think I tried to assume goodwill, you know, after some sort of a spiritual awakening, I saw that most people are not out there to get you, you know, even all these guys that are like vouching for political uh, handouts and whatnot, like they, they feel maybe powerless and they want to uh, call on mommy and daddy government to help them, right? So is there a way that we can um, achieve uh, a level of... Um, uh, you know, how can we help people that are in that situation without a government, if you will? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, freedom can be scary, especially if you have brought up in a way where your freedom is always compromised by your parents, you know, your school, your government. I was very fortunate. Uh, I had a lot of freedom as a child, and and I... I very early, I'll, I'll, this is a cute little story I don't often tell, but, you know, when I was a child, I watched Disney 
And one of the things that Disney had at the time I was a child was the uh, the Legend of the Swamp Fox, who was Colonel Francis Marion in the American Revolution. And that got really me really interested in liberty to see these people fighting for freedom, you know. So I got at a very early age got into the whole American Revolution thing, and and I think um, I, I think that when you're dealing with people who haven't had this experience of being free uh, in as they're taught in the childhood and they've always been suppressed, one of the things, if you're able to, is to help them. Uh, learn to express their own self and their freedom. Again, that's a whole nother big issue we could get into. If, if we're not able to do that personally in a deep way, we can at least do it in a, uh, how can I say, in a more superficial way and just, for example, give them examples that they're going to say yes to. For example, if you had a terminal disease and the FDA hadn't yet approved this drug but it seemed to be working in drug trials, would you want to have the choice of taking it or not. Now, almost everyone's gonna say, yeah, I want the choice. <laughs> so, you know, there are certain things that we all want and can see it very easily. So I just start with something like that and then show how the libertarian case can be made for that. And then people, oh, now I'm getting it, you know? I have to suffer the consequences, so I should be able to make the choice. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I like that, I, I honestly truly believe that uh, probably the clearest path to a peaceful world is through peaceful parenting. So, you know, when we grow up, we grow up uh, whole and, and, and uh, not without, like, I mean, there's going to be always rough patches any, anywhere. So, but the sure. idea that, you know, being able to uh, have the opportunity to mature and make decisions and, and like all our choices and actually even pay the consequences. Obviously, as a parent, you're going to be like yes. a form of fiduciary, you know, taking care of the little person, but not as a, a totalitarian regime that's right that's right so you know um how do good neighbors become bad neighbors that's something that i really liked from uh the book here that we have that you wrote um what is the answer to that well people become bad neighbors because they think it's going to profit them somehow so what our job is is to show that it does just the opposite and in the early days of libertarianism, you know, when I ran as a candidate in the 80s, we didn't have all these studies and everything we've got now. Now a libertarian and can, you know, actually point to studies which show that freedom works in the real world and just about everything. And that's why there are 1,300 references now in the fourth edition of Healing Our World, because there's so much I couldn't even cover it all. So one of the things we need to do is, you know, let's say, for example, they want government to take care of the environment. Well, then what we need to show them is that, first of all, the government's the biggest polluter, which most people don't know, and it has sovereign immunity. So it gets to pollute, and there's no consequences to it, or very few consequences. You can take them to court and win, as the uh, people did in Utah who were hurt by the atomic bomb testing. They won the court case, but they got no restitution or any cash settlement because the government has sovereign immunity. <laughs> That's ridiculous. If we all had to clean up our garbage, <laughs> we wouldn't throw it in the first place. And so the libertarian principles of restitution and um, you know responsibility really play a big part. And then of course, private property. When we privatize something, we're more likely to take care of it. You know, for example, um, in Britain, the fishing rights in rivers are still privately owned. So if somebody upstream pollutes, <laughs> you sue them. <laughs> you know, you get them to restore your property. But when I was living in uh, northern Kentucky, women came to my door and said, will you help us talk to these corporations because they're polluting the Ohio River and the APA won't do anything. Well, of course not, because <laughs> they can get paid off, right? Right. <laughs> so um, so the, the, the secret would be is if we still had property rights in the Ohio River, which were taken away by the government, uh, we would be able to sue. We wouldn't have to wait for the EPA. We wouldn't have to go begging to the corporation. We could, you know, take them to court immediately. So this is the kind of thing that we need to talk about. And endangered species, same thing when you privatize them. Uh, elephants in Kenya, for example, um, the herds have, have decreased so much because they banned hunting. But in Zimbabwe, where they allow it, 
of course, there's conditions, but they allow it, you know, and the, the natives have property rights in the elephants. Their herds are flourishing. They've doubled or I think it's close to tripling the number that they had. Wow. And, wow. and these, these countries did things at the same time. So you can track this and see that when you privatize land and beast, you know, the environment's protected. And of course, I could go on and on with more examples, but I just wanted to give your audience a little flavor of how libertarians really have the solutions for all these things that people want government for. So you, then, like, basically the idea is that the solution to pollution is privatization. Privatization, restitution, and an end to sovereign immunity. Now, a lot of people will say, well, you know, but what about the poor? You know, like, what if, yes. like, okay, I have seen like you know uh maybe a, a handful of uh, rich people that but purchase a park and then they make it public for people like i mean that happens all the time mm -hmm. but people don't get to see that so okay so if we're talking about this and then uh, we move towards the idea of jobs like destroying jobs what are the unintended consequences of the minimum wage because you know you hear all the 15 dollars an hour minimum wage what happens <laughs> when when this goes up well, people lose their jobs, and the people who lose them first are the disadvantaged. And that's because if you have to pay top dollar for an employee, and you don't have any, you have to pay this $15. You can't negotiate down to 12 say. Then you're going to hire the most socially acceptable type of person. <laughs> somebody who speaks English. <laughs> somebody who, you know, maybe looks like they came from the middle or upper class. Uh, you're not going to hire the um, person who's come in from another country and doesn't have good English. You're not going to hire the person who maybe is a different ethnic group than the people they're serving. You know, you're going to want to have somebody who looks identical to your clientele. So the people who get lose the, their jobs are the people in those disadvantaged categories because they can't negotiate. Like I had, um, I was working on a building, rehabilitating a building one time. And it was obvious I was doing that because there was stuff all over. <laughs> and I had um, a person who was a little bit mentally disabled come by and he said, I just live two doors down. I don't have a car. But if I could work here, you know, and and I would work for two dollars an hour. This is back in the eighties, so you know, I think minimum wage back then was maybe four. And he said, I, I'd be happy to do that. And if you liked me, you know, you might want to pay me more. Maybe you could give me a recommendation so I could get another job because I really have a hard time. I mean, I, I don't have a car. You know, I can't go anywhere. And I would have loved to hire him, but <laughs> I knew what the minimum wage was. And I was a little nervous about that. I could just see, because I was running for office as a libertarian, I could just see the headlines. Libertarian won't pay a disabled man minimum wage, right? So I wasn't going to do that. And I wanted to. I wanted to help him out. And I'm a good recommendation writer. <laughs> I would have been happy to recommend him and give him a letter that he could take to other employers. Uh, or even pay him more if he was worth it. It was a little hard to tell how much he was worth it, you know first glance yeah. but I couldn't so this is how people get put out of work yeah and poverty I'd like to just make one statement if sure. you wouldn't mind me interrupting poverty as we know it today would not exist in a libertarian society because most poverty almost all of it today is created by minimum wage and regulations that put the disadvantaged out of business and poverty is created by not having a stable job it's not created because people are physically incapable it's because they can't get and keep a job i totally agree with that and one thing that i like the you know the, the the stock story that i like to tell is like my dad started working when he was six years old and you know my he, that was back in the day you know like um late 40s so mm -hmm. The idea that, like, he was, uh, whatever little money he was making, he was able to help the household not starve because his dad was ill. So yes. Im imagine, like, my dad, there's hundreds of other little kids that in that, in that specific same, I guess, scenario where they could have been able to help. But, mm -hmm. if, you know, uh, because of regulation, because of all these things, they're, you know, relying on, or like starving maybe, or relying on some handouts that may or may not be there and just... Um, creating a, a population that is perpetually dependent mm -hmm. and that that's just right. hurts them more 
That's right. I've rented to these people. It's very hard for them because they're tempted to make a bad decision as high schoolers. A young woman gets pregnant at 16. Uh, she says, wow, if I have this baby, and I've had them come and tell me this. This isn't my making this up. You know, I can have this baby. I'll get a welfare check. I can get my own place, and I'll do fine. Well, of course, then she has the baby, and she realizes, whoops, the baby's expensive. <laughs> I can't buy diapers and everything I want to buy with this welfare check. I'll have another baby because then my welfare check will grow. And then she has the third one. Well, in Michigan, where I was at the time, the third one was the end of the line. So by the time she's 21, she has three children. She doesn't have a high school diploma, but she's figured out now, hey, I'm always going to be poor if I'm on welfare. I need to get a job. But the problem was she's got three little ones. The entry-level job for someone without a high school diploma isn't going to cut it. She's not going to get, she's not going to get child care. So unless she, her mother or grandmother or aunt or somebody takes care of those children, she's stuck forever in the poverty trap. Now, if she can find someone to take care of her children and she can hang in there for two years, at that point, that's about the sweet spot where now she starts bringing in more than the welfare check. But it takes that long, and that's a hard, very hard thing for many of them to do. So, of course, they can't. A lot of them can't, and they're stuck forever. Oh, I, I totally agree. I think that, you know, um, this may sound a little rough, but in my opinion, in my perspective, as an immigrant, um, poverty in the United States is a choice, only as one is disabled, of course. Uh, like if one really applies oneself to doing whatever, you know, I mean, they, they're able to, like you said, after a couple of years at any like entry level position, they can move places and, and just achieve whatever they need to. And, and in that, I have a great segue question for you. You know, mm -hmm. back in the early days, this nation, um, there was penniless immigrants that became affluent after starting yes. their own businesses. Yes, there weren't many regulations back then, so you didn't have to worry. Today, if you want to drive a taxi cab in New York City and you have to buy a medallion, which you might not have to today if you work for Uber, but you know, if you have to buy a medallion, it's a million bucks. No, no poor person can afford that, but some of them might be able to afford a car to take people around. Yeah, that's that's extremely crazy. It gets uh, more complicated every time for everybody. So um, now. People say, well, maybe we need more legislation, right? <laughs> It's the opposite of what we need. Because, you know, there's these unintended consequences. People think making a law makes it so, but <laughs> that's not true. When you perturb the system with a law, things change. They shuffle around. It, it's, you can't keep everything else constant and make a law. It doesn't work that way. And neither does biology. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's something that I really like, the idea, like biology and, and economics and, and, and liberty, they are so, like, I can see a lot of uh, parallel points. Yes. And, and, like, freedom and biology, like, they're, 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 there's never an empty spot, so you cannot, like, um, rob from one, like, molecule to put in another, like, they combine, and, like, there's always a, a, a balance at any rate. So on that one, like if we talk about money, because I think that that's super related to money, that's, mm -hmm. that's a very important subject. How do we, like a lot of people have, I guess, shadow of money, if you will. Um, but in reality, it's not money that they hate, but the monopoly of who makes the money. Can you tell that's us right. some about that? Sure. Well, you know, back when we had gold-backed currency, it could have been backed by anything, but it was backed by gold. Okay, so there's a limited amount of gold. So if you had to make your promises good to give the holder of the note the, their gold, you couldn't inflate very much. Governments hate that. <laughs> so that's why we ended up going off the gold standard. And once we did, you know, our country inflated money quite a bit. Now, inflation hurts the poor the most. Uh, you know, think about um, an elderly person on a fixed income. It's either their pension, social security, whatever. I mean, you know, they're not making a lot of money. They're retired. But at the rate we're currently inflating, their buying power is cut in half about every seven to ten years. Wow. And so if they live another 20 years past the time when they retire, they're going to be on 25% of what they started with. You know, you can't. They're not going to be able to make it. So it really hurts the elderly quite a bit and anyone else on a fixed income. Yeah. It's very destructive. So what's the solution to that? 
Well, you know, there's there's a couple different ones. One, of course, is to have a metal backed or some other commodity backed um, a currency, which would we'd already have if the government allowed competition in currency. There's been several attempts to have that. Um, the Liberty Dollar, for example, was one. I don't know if you remember that or not, but um, um, and uh, you know there were there were um, e gold was another one. You could buy either gold, silver, platinum, or palladium. Put your money into one of those commodities, and you could switch it around. And so your your currency was always backed. But the government ran them out of business, basically made them declare themselves a bank and then subject to the banking laws and then subject to <laughs> all the currency restrictions. And that, that yeah. killed it. Yeah. Uh, are you, uh, I guess, a believer in cryptocurrencies? You know, I I will freely admit that I... I'm a believer in trying those, but I don't understand them as well, I think, as I should. <laughs> um, yes, you know, like Bitcoin and stuff. I mean, that may turn out to be, I think there's actually been a court ruling on Bitcoin that might help it because I think, I th and I'm trying to remember exactly what the details were, but I, they didn't consider it a currency, which was very good for Bitcoin. Um, I can't remember what they did consider it, but they didn't consider it a currency. So that that may have been like one of the biggest court cases uh, in history if they continue to um, uphold that. Now, time dollars also won in court. I mean, they were trying to tax time dollars, which basically you put your time in a bank and then you could trade your time. So you might trade five hours of babysitting for, you know, a doctor's visit or something, whatever. <laughs> and there was a court case on that as well. And time dollars was because there was no way to enforce. You couldn't force the exchange. So and that's another thing, you know, if you want to pay your taxes or pay something, you have to use the Federal Reserve, you know, it is, and you have to accept them as well, you know, unless you have a special contract of some sort, but you have to accept them to settle debt, which is a problem if you, <laughs> if, if the currency has lost value. <laughs> I heard a loophole in that sentence, like, unless there is a contract, are, can people trade legally with some other stuff besides Federal Reserve notes? Well, you know, you could you could actually make your contract payable in gold. I mean, if you, I, I don't know how you'd have to structure it. You'd have to be careful how you structured it because you'd have to make it come out in such a way that it, you weren't being paid back in dollars, if you see what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give you legal advice on this, um, nor can I even talk about it more than I have because I, I don't more, know more than that. But I suspect there may be a way to, um, if you are someone who's holding debt, there may be a way for you to structure it. That's exciting. Again, yeah, I think you'd have to really get a good attorney because it, it's going to be challenged. So you've got to be ready for that. <laughs> I like that. That sounds a lot of fun. Some great Googling day or afternoon. So, you know, something that I, I guess we missed or I missed to ask you, like the idea is um, there's always a, a set of uh, individuals that fall under, you know, that through the cracks and, and they, they really need help. Mm -hmm. um, how can we take care of that in an anarchist society? Well, actually, you know, it's happening today because if you think about it, the homeless, they don't get welfare checks because the condition of getting a welfare check is to have an address. <laughs> so who's taking care of them? You don't see the social workers going out there feeding them. No, it's the churches, it's the soup kitchens, it's the individuals. Here in Texas, it's actually against the law to feed them. So the last time that a libertarian group wanted to feed the uh, homeless, I think it was on Thanksgiving, they strapped on their holsters and... Uh, carried guns to the scene where they were distributing. And I think wisely, the police decided that they weren't going to bother them. I love that. Yeah, I, I, you know, a couple of my friends actually were the ones that did that, and, and that was super exciting to see. Uh, yes, it, it, I can't remember the city. Do you remember the city? Yeah, it was in Dallas. Dallas, okay, okay. I, I couldn't remember if it was Austin or Dallas, but I was all excited. That's yeah, great. That was super well, exciting. 
And you know, actually, there's a private organization called Pride. I think it's. I think I'm citing the right one. I talk about it in the new edition of Healing Our World. Uh, who actually decided they were not going to um, warehouse the disabled. They were going to teach them how to do something useful, and they were so successful. <laughs> You know, these people are making money. They've expanded into multiple states. So even if you're disabled, um, you know, which, of course, is, you know, obviously makes your life a little more difficult, a lot more difficult. Uh, you know, there are ways in which the private sector is really helping. And, you know, we need to embrace these and talk about them as libertarians because this is the proof of the pudding. You know, most people have been so... Um, conditioned by government schooling to believe certain things that they just don't, you know, I mean, you really have to hit them with, with good proof. You know, when I used to lecture on libertarianism in the 1980s in the schools, I would say things like, well, we all know the private sector is more efficient than government. Everyone would nod their heads. This was well known back then. Now, if I go into the classroom and say that, the teachers argue with me and tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, so things have changed. And if that's what the teachers are teaching, then we've got an even bigger problem than we did in the 80s. I think people were more libertarian leaning in the 80s, but unfortunately, uh, you know, that's not the case today. I will say that the younger generation is almost split, though. I mean, there are younger people who really have got their act together and are at the top of their game, and there's a lot of them. So I'm, I'm hopeful in spite of that. <laughs> You're hopeful. I am, too. I, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I think we're still at a good time where we can do a lot of great work to turn things around. Yes, yes, yes. So let's see, you know, if we're talking about that split you know, generation that's um, kind of wanting a lot of um, handouts, like the idea of uh, communism, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They provide for the common good. Now, I have a couple of questions. Why is that a bad idea, and who determines what the common good is? <laughs> well, you can't. <laughs> I mean, the common good, in my opinion, is if you maximize, if each individual can maximize their own good, then the common good is served. Because what we are is a collection of individuals. Now, I say that assuming that we're not going to initiate force, fraud, or theft against each other, obviously. But if, we, if that's our only restriction, uh, then we can maximize our income. We talked about poverty. We can get rid of that. You know, we can protect the environment. I haven't talked about deterring crime and diffusing terrorism, but we can do that too. I mean, liberty works. It works. And if you think about why it should work, you know, we've always talked about it in moral or what I call ethical terms, right? <laughs> but how do we derive our ethics? We derive it because if we say something's ethical or moral, what we're really saying is if we do this thing, then humankind will survive and thrive. So we're basing it on practical application, <laughs> if you think about it. And so the proof of the pudding for any uh, ism, uh, socialism, communism, libertarianism, is does it work in the real world? And the only ism that has supportive studies that I'm aware of to the extent uh, that would be believable is the libertarian ethic. Yes, you can find oddball studies here and there which seem to support a different direction, but that's sort of what happens in the game of chance of doing studies. <laughs> you know, nothing's 100%. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you roll the dice, you will get snake eyes. That's right. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, the, there's something that I want your help with, you know, uh, the idea between liberty and love, can they be mm -hmm. together? And if you can expand a little bit on that, because that was something that I really liked, for, you know, that you talked about on the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess there's different ways to look at it. Um, obviously, the, the most obvious one we talked about, in other words, if you love somebody, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to steal from them, you're not going to defraud them, you're not going to assault them. That's pretty obvious. And if you hurt them in some way, you'll try to make it right for them. So, I mean, that's the libertarian principles. And if you look closely, the, the oldest statement of libertarian principles that I'm aware of, there may be an older one, are the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. <laughs> Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not covet anything that is your neighbor's. 
And of course, thou shall not commit adultery, which would be breaking your contract, because back then a marriage contract included fidelity. So I find that, you know, and of course, um, Christ told everyone to love their neighbors themselves for those who are re religiously inclined. That all makes sense to a Christian libertarian. It's a nice package, but it's, it's also an ethical package because what happens when we love? Well, if you think about it for a moment, okay, if you don't love somebody, then you're judging them usually. In other words, let's say that I don't have a very loving attitude towards you. I don't like you because you have black hair or you're young or something or male, you know. So I'm doing all this judging, right? And this judging depersonalizes you to me. And it lets me justify assault or fraud. Oh, he's so stupid. He deserves to get defrauded. You know, it kind of goes down there. And then, you know, he's such a bad guy because, you know, he's, he's mean to women or something or something. So if I bash his head in, it's okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you see what happens when you start, when you stop loving by, and by loving here, I mean, universal love. So, you know, loving a person is respecting them, honoring their choices. Of course, if I were criticizing everything about you and judging you, I wouldn't be doing that. And once we cross that line, we've set ourselves up for a justification for aggression. And you were asking earlier how we talk to people about this. And if you talk to socialists or um, even liberals or anyone who wants government aggression, you'll hear a version of this. Oh, we need to um, force employers to pay higher wages because they won't do it on their own. They're bad people, see? <laughs> Once you start down that road, you are setting yourself up. You're giving yourself an out for aggression. And that's exactly, exactly what's happening today. So that's what the connection between love and liberty is. If we don't love our neighbor, we set ourselves up for a justification for aggression. It becomes much easier to aggress against them. I absolutely love the last thing you said, you know, the idea, you know, giving ourselves a pass for aggression by not, oh my gosh, that's so priceless. I was actually wanting to ask you some about that and, and you just covered it beautifully. Um, I am very excited about this. Is there anything else you would like to share from either the book or anything else that we haven't covered that you think is important? Well, I'd like to tell one story uh, because it, it helps. I think uh, the line we're going down. I mean, one of the things people say when I say liberty gives just about everyone what they want, they say, no, the people who want power, it doesn't give them uh, what they want. So I want to talk about that for a minute. Because I once had the opportunity to briefly get to know someone who was in the power structure and who was actually designing the propaganda that we hear. Uh, and it was encouraging people to go along with government aggression. And I didn't think this person seemed very happy. So I, one day I asked him, you know, uh, what do you think it take to make you happy? And I mean, I kind of was, I didn't really expect what I heard and I didn't understand it for quite a while. <laughs> but what he said was, well, you know, I don't feel connected to the rest of the human race. And I think to be happy, I would have to feel connected. Wow. Now th think about what we just discussed. This person was judging the American public as, you know, easily deceived, um, you know, gullible, deserving of exploitation, you know, think about it. That's because that's what he was helping to do, right? And so, I mean, he's basically now divorced himself from <laughs> most everyone he knows. Uh, even, I, I mean, he even lied to his parents at different times because he didn't think they could take the truth, you know? Okay, so look at this. I mean, he's, he's judged everyone by that. Because of that, he's separated himself from, he doesn't feel connected anymore. And I think, he, I think he properly diagnosed his problem that he would have to feel connected. But he was judging. He wasn't loving. He wasn't honoring his neighbor's choice, right? So he was not being a libertarian, obviously, but 
look at what he had done to himself. He had he had power and money. And I had originally asked him what his goals in life were before I asked him the happiness question because I, I wasn't, I didn't have my mind in the right place. And he said his goals were power and money. He had it, but he wasn't happy. And yeah. he wasn't happy because the things he did to get the power and money basically guaranteed that he couldn't be happy. And so I guess the message, I I'm, I'm did a little long-winded, but I was trying to get get the point out that even the people who go after power and money, they do it because they think it's going to make them happy. And it doesn't because if they make it, not by, not through libertarian means, but if they make it by a, a government aggression, then they've already forfeited the happiness they're going after. That is super powerful. I guess that brings a couple of things to mind, like the idea of, you know, there's some people that think, well, um, if, if there is libertarianism, there's going to be a lot of people that are uh, power hungry and they're just going to want to, uh, you know, loot and exploit and do all these crazy things. And, and like now the second one, um, we care about the poor and that's why we do it. So, uh, you know, the, the, I guess they they feel so powerless that they need to be able to do all of these things. So uh, if there is liberty, um, would people be able to just subjugate others? Uh, it would be harder to do than it is today because they use government to subjugate everyone and they do it easily because people believe in government. <laughs> Now, if people, if everybody in, in the country saw things the way you and I do, that wouldn't be so easy. It's happening because they, they teach them in government schools that government is good, government is here for you, government's here to protect you. Government is like an abusive parent. If you think about a child that is abused by their parent, you take them away and they want to go back. Why? Because that's what they know. And they don't want to believe that their loving, quote, loving parent would ever hurt them, right? I mean, think about it. If you're a child and, and you're going, my parent doesn't love me enough, to stop beating me. That's a pretty scary thing for a kid, right? And I think the American public in, in many ways is like that too, because when we started as a country, people were proud of their government, but it was a good government because it was small. <laughs> Now it's grown big and people still think it's a good government. They don't realize that it's become a monster, you know? And so this is, this is our challenge. And we can do it in such a loving way because they're hurting themselves. I mean, yes, they're hurting us too. But, you know, I'll tell you, when you, and you, I'm sure you felt this, when you understand the idea of political liberty, really understand that, the day you get it, it's like, it's like you open up, right? You, I think every libertarian's experienced this. It's, you have some wonderment. Yes, you have some angst because you realize things aren't the way they could be. But you wouldn't trade that knowledge back in. No, you wouldn't take that pill back <laughs> you know? and be ignorant again because there's something that elevates us understanding truth. So we want that. We want that. I, I love it. I love it so much. There's something that, you know, I, I get to see a lot of, uh, I get to hang out with tons of uh, executives because of the work I do and a lot of uh, entrepreneurs. And 99.9% um, of all these guys, they're not after power and money. They have a vision and, and a desire. So like if somebody says, you know, I want to open a restaurant or I want to like do, you know, a coal power plant or I want to be able to do this, like mainly most people do that out of uh, 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 The spirit passion. is moving. Me. Yeah, passion. It's not like out of, uh, you know, I'm just going to try to see how much money I can make. And like Yeah, yeah. No, it's not enough. Money's not enough motivation. <laughs> When I was writing Healing Our World, it took me five years. I was on cloud nine the whole time. <laughs> And I had so many issues come up that could have distracted me. But, you know, I had been given this gift almost in an instantaneous fashion of this understanding. And I just wanted to share it with everyone because it's so elevating. And that's what they have as well in their specialty. Whatever their specialty is, they see a better way and they want to share it. Absolutely. I think it's a very aware way to see the world. And, you know, ultimately anybody sees in the world what's inside of them. It's a reflection of themselves. So I think that's uh, the, the, one of the main problems that I see in libertarianism or anarchism is that uh, it takes a lot of self-work. It takes a lot of uh, inner 
demon working and, and it's just all here basically mm -hmm. um, yes. You know, just to close, um, I, I, I guess, you know, after all you told me, it's kind of incredible that you wouldn't have, but um, uh, have you, just out of curiosity, done any kind of teaching plants like ayahuasca or San Pedro or um, um, psilocybin? I haven't done those, but I have done um, inner work programs. I still do them. <laughs> I just keep moving along. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yes, and, and they're all valuable. You know, it, it just depends where you are and what appeals to you. Like and what, Silva Method, Holosync, what do you do? Oh, uh, right now, well, I'm, I'm kind of into non-duality. Is that something you're familiar with? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so, I, I, was in, I went to India um, in January, and it was wonderful, to the Ramana Maharshi. Oh, my Ashi. gosh. <laughs> and uh, there was a teacher I was with that uh, was having satsang. It was wonderful. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm a certified yoga instructor, too. And, and Oh, yes. Yes, teaching. I do yoga. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, friends, I'm really grateful that you stayed with us. Uh, Ms. Mia Rudward, she is an awesome activist, writer, scientist, and all sorts of coolness. So, um, is there uh, maybe a plug-in that you would like to do for a yes. book, website, anything? Well, if your listeners go to my website at ruart.com, R-U-W-A-R-T.com, they can go to my free library. They can actually read for free the 1993 edition of Healing Our World and lots of other good free stuff. Absolutely. Do you have a Facebook page, too? Yes, I have two Facebook pages. One is Mary Ruart and one is, I think, Mary J. Ruart, Ph.D. Fabulous. Thank you so much. And to all of you, if you really like this, please share it. I think it's a very informative and juicy interview with lots of great stuff. Um, we have, if you have any questions or comments, just put them down below at the comment section. And uh, as always, peace, love, and anarchy. Thank you so much. Thank you.